Holy cow, we're live. <laughs> it's the wrong day, and it's the wrong time, and we had zero prep for this show. But it's the right but guess two. what? <laughs> it's day four with the man Frank Scalish on a day five, Friday, high noon, opening day, season opener at the Palace on the Prairie tonight, the house that Bud built, historic Owen Field, Gaylord <laughs> Memorial Stadium, packed place. Had to add another 25,000 seats. They could fit a hundred grand and got the new SEC logo on the field. And we are ready to do battle with Temple at 6 p.m. Central time tonight, Frank. And we're going to talk bass fishing. And I said that intro just because we may have a special guest a little bit later on. And I got to get it in while I can. That's correct. Dude, nice to see you live. Thank you. I left, uh, I left Ontario, Canada, the middle, went up the North Shore and then crossed over and i left there at 7 a.m uh yesterday now i almost did not make it back into the country and it was not because of me so <laughs> i went i went with my uncle uh, a family a little bit of a remembrance trip from for my uncle jeff who was an avid fisherman our family went up there for 50 60 years my grandma and grandpa started uncle jeff passed away kind of did a little memorial trip for him with my other uncle who hadn't fished in 12 years but caught the hell out of smallmouth on a zebco 33 uh <laughs> so we're on our way back in to the united states and uh you know i've got uh, my four walleye with the skin tags on them. Yeah. And I was nervous because I forgot I had a bell pepper and there was a sign that said, please declare all vegetables and meats. So he said, do you have anything to declare? I said, I got my four walleye, one over 18, three under. I said, I also got a bell pepper and a pack of hot dogs and he's running it. And all of a sudden there's a U.S. border patrol on both sides of the back of the boat both sides of the truck right at the doors in the front and three people there and they all have their hands on their weapons. And when something happened with, and I have global entry uh, cause you know, Courtney's a flight attendant, right, Frank? So she's like, Hey, we got to get you global entry so we can globe trot, but something tripped to where a silent alarm and we were surrounded by us border patrol. What the hell was it, dude? I don't know. It was wild. And uh, after two or three minutes, they like huddled and the guy came back and he handed back the passport to my uncle. And he said, sorry about that. There's someone with a very similar name of you that has done some really bad things. Have a good day. Oh, similar to you or to your uncle? No, name? similar to my uncle's name. Holy He's got a common smoke. name. Yeah. So like it was it was pretty tense there for probably about two and a half minutes. He clearly did some pretty bad things. Not my uncle, the guy with right. the name. Right. Now your uncle. Now, you know, I've been guy. to Europe and Canada and Mexico and all that in the past 10 months. So it's not like, you know, I I'm good to go. Wow. But so anyway, I'm back and it's small mouse season and we'll bloviate well, uh in the second half of the show. I mean, dude, you, you, you literally, I mean, you, you had a good event, dude. I had a good day I had 23, 10 of smallmouth on leech Lake on, uh, on day two, top 10, the open there with smallmouth, but uh, you cannot talk about a ninth place finish and keep our guests waiting because he is coming off of a first yeah. place and a second place finish the points leader in the Northern Toyota, uh, MLF division. He actually got off the water from catching gigantic bass, Kyle Cordiana, Thank you for jumping on BTL. It's it's like five years overdue. I'm actually embarrassed that I have not had you on the show yet. You <laughs> are one of well, you're from Oklahoma. You've been catching them. You have a long list of top tens. You're perennial up oh, yeah. there. You win the points, and I have not had you on the show. It has not been intentional. I apologize for that. You can you can be a regular from now on. Hey man, I'm glad <laughs> I will be. Happy to be a regular if you so choose, man. Thanks for the, cl the closest we have been together is we fished a Toyota together. I think we were in the same in like 19 or something. And we were both, I was, I was like that son of a gun because we were both running the same pattern. And you were, I'm not even going to say what it is because I got the Bass Nation Championship out there and you were one ahead of me. And then when I caught up, I realized why the schools were busted up. I'll tell you after on this particular thing. And it's because you were literally jumping the exact same thing I was. And I didn't catch you until after drowning. Where were we? 
We were oh, on Grand. Grand, when you said drowning, yeah. Late in the year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm I, talking about? Yeah, I probably do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Good story. All right, Frank, show's yours. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> dude, I've been driving. I have. I've been. I've literally got home half an I hour know, ago. Dude, from a Twenty-six-hour drive. I jumped in the shower. I haven't shaved in two weeks. Threw my OU stuff on. Took a shot at Kyle because I know he's a, a OSU guy. And here we are. <laughs> I'm good with that. I'm good with that. So, dude, man, I mean, you got you came off of like some extraordinary smallmouth waters, and the crazy enough thing is that. Um, I grew up fishing them on Lake Erie over here, and our lake has changed vastly from all the tournament pressure. Um, when you wh- where you're at now, wh- do you think that that's going to affect them at all? First Down of all, where are you talking about here in Clayton? Here yeah. in St. Louis? Mm-hmm. No, man. I, I mean, you say that because you're talking about Erie, and it's a great lake. I just I just feel like it's invincible up here. I've always felt like the Lake Ontario St. Lawrence river combo. Like, I don't think you can hurt it just because of the seasons and just the, the growth that's shown year after year. And some of that's because our technology has advanced. It's not because the anglers have gotten better. It's because they've gotten better with technology, but the other side of it is the fish are getting bigger. So it's kind of, yeah. it, it's, and they're still getting bigger. I got here this year and before this Toyota series, and I was catching, you know, 26-pound bags of smallmouth in a time of year. And I've, this is three years in a row I've been up here for over a month straight. And I've never seen that kind of quality come out of the river. I was like, dude, these fish are getting bigger. And they are. They're getting bigger. That's a good That's a good let, thing. Let me read off your last uh, six days of smallmouth fishing, Kyle, because you won on Champlain. Now, you you had all brown on Champlain, right? You didn't have any green. No, I weighed in. I did what? weigh in one. Wait a minute. No, I didn't. All brown. I That's what I thought. Yep. Uh, you won the Northern Series points. So your last six days of smallmouth fishing, I believe in, well, in the, we'll just do the Toyota Series because wasn't was St. Clair in between the Toyota Series and the, yeah. the St. Lawrence, but here's your last six days on 20 pounds, even 22, three, 21, 14, 25, 12, 21, five and 23, 14. And you have pocketed $56,000 in earnings over those six days of smallmouth fishing on Lake Champlain and the St. Lawrence river. Yeah. And yeah. And it doesn't include all the contingency dollars, you know, that you might be, uh, eligible for so yeah yeah great six days for sure that is fabulous dude god that's that's stout man that's good fishing so hey so so you know and all you're running around because i in, in all honesty um i don't follow a lot of the tournament trail stuff going on I, I i don't follow it around so so when um when i called you to come on the show i started looking it up and it's pretty it's pretty f- impressive dude it's for a dude pretty, from oklahoma too broken yeah. arrow that's that's what i'm saying i mean coming from w- coming from where you live to come up here and and take over the smallmouth game against some of the heavy hitters is pretty that's pretty stout man um without a doubt it's a very hard hard thing to do uh you know this show this show's weird because we go we go in a million different directions um ne- i never really know where it's gonna end up or sometimes like today how it's gonna start um i'm intrigued by i am not a forward-facing sonar guru by any stretch of the imagination Um, I'm getting way better at it. Thanks to Matt and the help of my son and some of my buddies, I'm getting better at it. I've noticed that certain things show up better on forward facing sonar than other things. Um, I'm really excited about, uh, the new jerk bait that, uh, that Booyah had, and I have not had a chance to fish it yet. And so I'm relying heavily on your information because 
yet literally yesterday i just ordered 350 dollars worth so <laughs> so i need your i need to know um, yeah talk to me dude talk to me about talk to me about how you fished up there yeah man so if it's on the st lawrence river uh at icast i had been given i had like three of these this is it right here this is this is the one that came out today that's the sexy shad color i literally had three of these i had this one in two other colors one was gold and the other one uh was a pro blue color but i only had three colors in it uh but being a jerk bait like i'm a i love jerk bait fishing there's no other way i'd like to do it and yeah it's great for forward facing sonar but you don't need forward facing sonar to know where to throw your jerk bait and work it wait on that rod that you know the next twitch it just locks up like there's nothing more fun than twitching a jerk bait around uh are we jerk yeah. baiting you? i don't yeah. know you're jerk baiting uh, yeah so <laughs> that's it, outstanding it, it hands down my favorite way to fish so i was really excited to get back here with icast with these and uh tied them on immediately and i'm not at line i'm not exaggerating is oh we're talking about like a bad day that was a bad day of jerk baiting right there <laughs> anyway, uh, that uh, the first day I took this thing out, I think I caught like 24 pounds on it in like two or three hours. Dang. And that, that's when I was like, holy crap. Not only did I notice that the fish are bigger, I was like, dude, I could win this thing on a jerk bait. Like, how fun would that be? Because it's, it's really an efficient way to fish the river. Um, oh, yeah. There's, there's, you know, you, you can come up with your pattern or whatever you're looking for, your common denominators and, and the depth and the current and the grass or the sand, you know, whatever you're looking for, and you can just run it. And if they're there, dude, if they you don't it. have sonar, you'll know if they're there. You'll, you'll get a bite or you want. If you do, you'll know real fast. You'll see them start pursuing it or not. So uh, not only is it really efficient, but it's a fun, fun way to catch them. Like yeah, so the crazy thing is, you you know Dan from Great Lakes Finesse. Yeah. So Dan Dan and Chad uh, went out fishing it, and Dan said something crazy. He said that that jerk bait seemed like it always took the biggest the biggest fish out of the rock pile or the grass edge that they were fishing it. It seemed like the biggest ones took that bait um and so and and i i jerk bait fish a lot dude i mean a ton and um that was intriguing to me because of the action and and the and the the blade in the head um of this thing the the here's the here's wait a second i hit something on my computer and something went no through. you're good you're still rolling something went wrong okay so uh -oh. the big the biggest thing about this bait that that I'm taking away from it is how it, it shows up on, if you're live scoping, how it shows up on forward facing. Um, the casting system in it is, is it's a, a casting system like, you know, they're supposed to be so you could cast the thing. The blade in the head helps it on forward facing sonar, but the blade in the head, it's a tiny blade. I didn't know it was so small. I thought it was giant. Um, the, the blade in the head is a tiny little blade. And so when the bait pitches and rolls, cause you know how jerk baits, they quiver, they pitch and they roll. You get it. You get a very small, subtle flash from the blade, which I think could be a really big triggering mechanism because it's not overdone. It's not like a number four willow blade where it's won't won't. It's a giant flash. This is a small flash. Um, so that was the other thing that intrigued me about the bait. Um, aside from the fact that it's truly a suspending bait, which is very important um, for some of the applications that I have coming up. So I was really intrigued by it, but I've never fished one and you have, and I want to know. <laughs> yeah. um, I would say your assumptions pretty good because some of those areas I was throwing that there's a lot of smaller fish living there. Mm -hmm. And I caught, two sixes a five and three quarter a five and a quarter a four and three quarter and it's like every time i leaned into it i'm like are they all that big or am i catching the biggest one there you know and yeah. uh you know there's a bunch of two and a half to three and a half pounders everywhere on the saint lawrence river and so there there is something that's got to be i keep talking to myself i'm like why is it 
And it really might have to be that little willow blade. Like it really could be that because there's something to it, whether it's, it's got a unique action to it that they like, maybe they like the fatter abdomen to the bait, the little bit bigger profile. But to me, the big bold difference is the blade. And, you know, I got my buddy, he flew up here from Oklahoma with me and, uh, He's like, does it flash? And I just put it in the water and twitched it twice. And I mean, it literally puts out a blinding, just a just small little blinding flash. And you know, as well as I do up here on the St. Lawrence River, the majority of the forge here that is a, a shiner or minnow or whatever is really, really tiny. If you're ever up here in the fish up check like bait, if it's not a yellow perch or a goby, it's a tiny little, you know, I don't know if it's an emerald shiner. I don't know what it is, but they're tiny little shiners. And that blade is real small, so I don't know. And the color schemes, dude, it has all that little glitter in the back of every one of them. I'm a huge fan of, like, the theory of when a bait gets hit, like, the scales fly off the bait, and it, like, puts this, like, glittery flash in the water. And uh, I think yeah. that a twitching like that, and they see that sparkle combined with that flash, I do. I think it triggers some instincts on those big ones where they just can't, they can't refuse it, man. It makes them really, really angry. Yeah, I just, you know, I just was, I'm, I was curious about, you know, because I haven't fished it yet, but I, but I am going to fish it now. Um, I, I got, I got a couple in. Chad sent me a couple for the show to do the show, and then when I saw them and I got them, I'm like, high quality hooks, split rings, paint jobs, and so I went all in yesterday because i figured after we talk about it and they're promoting it pretty heavy that there may not be any left so Wait, I you're didn't... still buying stuff from the company that you work for full-time frank yeah matt we, can't we had this, this talk last we month can't go down make the call <laughs> say hey hook me up with some of these jerk baits you don't have to be using our 15 percent discount code by for yourself like you're literally buying the baits that you're painting and that you're talking about Correct, but I, it, oh. they do stuff for me. I, I don't. I don't pay for everything. You know what I mean? Is that pro blue? Yeah. Do you love this? Yeah. Look how, look how amazing this color is. Look at that thing, dude. Again, it's got your favorite colors. Is that like one of your top three? Like, if you're just gonna pick up two to try them, is that definitely one of them? That's me? definitely one of them, dude. Now, now, Kyle, you haven't thrown them yet, Frank. I know, but that's one of my favorite colors right there. Okay. Yeah, it's oh, a, that one. I don't have – I only brought a few out of the boat, and obviously the sexy shad one. This one literally made me a believer within 30 minutes of fishing it. I was converted to a flashpoint user within 30 minutes because of that sexy shad. <sighs> but this is a deep diver. We haven't got this one out. We're, these are still – we're still working on these. But uh, they sent me that one because I liked the shallow one so much, I got a deep one. And this <laughs> – yeah. Uh, obviously yeah. the smallmouth I mean the jerk bait is no secret for smallmouth. No. We've seen no. what KVD and what a number of guys have done. It's one of the oldest lures of the book. But would you agree that over the past 2 years and like I said you're 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 an Oklahoma dude but it seems to me like a lot of the world is realizing oh smallmouth are minnow and bait fish oriented where for so many years it seemed i mean at least for me crawfish patterns tubes crawfish crankbaits bottom yeah. stuff ned rig and now it seems like every single major event is dominated by jerk baits and minnows and not just on alewife lakes like champlain you're seeing it on the saint lawrence we saw it on leech we've seen it we're seeing it on all of the major smallmouth fisheries that these things like minnows a lot oh, yeah 100 percent, dude um my all my smallmouth fishing um even even drop shotting i'm imitating minnows mostly but that um, you've done that for years frank yeah. that's not like new to you because no, i just dude. when i first started smallmouth fishing it was crayfish 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 no, dude, I I ca I caught more big smallmouths on crankbaits than than practically any lure I own. Crankbaits and jerkbaits, like like there was a tournament on Erie, um, that I I wound up taking fourth in it, and I caught every one of them on a rogue. Hmm. Yeah, back in the back in the old days before we even knew anything about 
I mean, we didn't even, we didn't even, you know, back way back then, technology was just evolving. We didn't even know what we know now today. Interesting. Uh, so you're up just there, just hanging out and having fun now. You got a buddy there and you're just <laughs> catching fish. I mean, what? Yeah, that's it, man. We, uh, my wife and I fell in love with this place. This is our third year. We fell in love with this Clayton, New York, the village of Clayton, and me, obviously, the St. Lawrence River. But my wife started getting into yoga three years ago here. She made a bunch of friends. She comes back. She goes to yoga. She loves all the little coffee shops. And obviously, the scenery and the sunsets right here are, like, incredible. Um, and the fishing's just phenomenal. But, yeah, we're just hanging out here. We came here straight after St. Clair. So we've been here since the very end of July. And wow. we're not until September 12th, I got to go back to Oklahoma to do an engineering conference. And uh, otherwise, I'd stay I'd stay a couple more weeks. But I don't want to be here when it gets real cold. No, you don't. <laughs> so I don't know if you're allowed. So we, you came on five minutes earlier and you're talking about what you've been catching them on this week. Are you cool with talking about that? Because that's kind of badass. Yeah, I'm cool with talking about it. I won't give up all the details, but I'll, I'll we can darn sure talk about it. It's Frank, just, it's one of Frank's favorite baits that's been that, since it came out. Oh, I bet. I bet. <laughs> he seems like that kind of that say kind of, say what you want about it, but I mean it's a it's a, a multi bait rig, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The flash mob. Yep, yep. For sure. Yeah. No, it's a. Uh, you know, every year when we go to a new stop or an old stop, you know, as an angler, you're always trying to figure out something a little different. And uh, the A-Rig's come and gone, you know. It, all, everybody banned it or they didn't ban it or they eliminated it to three hooks or two hooks or whatever they've done to it. But the bottom line is over the years, you start to realize which baits have the most draw power. And the Flash Mob Jr. has an incredible draw power. Yeah. It just like a glide bait and a jerk bait, uh, they can't resist coming and inspecting it and often eating it. And so anytime you can employ those baits, I think you set yourself up to have an advantage over the rest of your competitors, period. But you can't always use them, you know? No, it's, it's a, it's a definitely a tool. Um, and it's a lot of fun to fish. I mean, it's, I've had, I, the best year I had with the flash mob was two years ago. That was the best year I had with it. And I'll be honest with you. I kind of, I kind of gravitated uh, to the jerk bait more um, than the flash mob because we got, we got so much fishing pressure here, especially in the cold months where everyone says you're supposed to throw it. Um, we got so much fishing pressure here with it that they see them all the time. And so I started going jerk baiting on them and changing some of the tactics on how and how I'm fishing the jerk bait and where I'm fishing the jerk bait. Um, and it's been insanely effective. So <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to blow the whistle on that because I'll ruin it for myself here. Because our, our, all our lakes, dude, where we live, they're about this big. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have water. We have nothing except the big lake. So in this last one, you also threw the uh, one of the baits that I threw a lot last week in the open on leech. I ended up I caught nine. I wish I'd caught ten. If I'd caught ten, it would have been about a fifteen thousand dollar difference. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> but uh, so I accidentally got them because they were supposed to be sent to Frank and they got sent to my house. And then I was like, can we just send like more to Frank and then I can just like keep these? And they were like, yeah, no problem. So I get there and leech and this, this, uh, the very first smallmouth I catch on a, on a flatworm, uh, spits up this minnow and it's got a, a line down its back and it's called a spot tail shiner. I think yep, is what the tail. guy I was mm -hmm. staying with said. And I said, well, by God, that new three, I said, there's a freaking uh, GLF drop minnow that looks exactly like this spot tail minnow. And I put it on and that's the one right there. <laughs> that's the one. Yeah. That's smelt. 
Yep. That's the one. Yeah. Huh. So you know exactly which one I was talking about. Oh yeah, this is my this is this is new this year to iCast this color and this yeah. is, this has quickly become one of my go-tos. Yep. Uh but that also played in your uh second place finish on the St. Lawrence this past last week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I definitely feel like for me, I like to have deep fish and shallow fish here. And for me, your shallow fish, you can target them all kinds of different ways. You can still target them with a drop shot if you want. I chose to target them with a jerk bait, but you could, there's a, there's all kinds of different ways. People target them with a hair jig, spy bait, it, you know, wacky worms even play here. Nico rigs, Ned rigs, it don't matter. You can fish these target, these shallow fish however you want. I love jerk bait fishing. Me and Frank understand that. We're going to probably throw a jerk bait shallow fish if they'll bite it. And then on your deep fish, you've got your fish that are just roaming on deep, on deep shoals and humps and stuff like that. And they're just roaming. And so there are all kinds of ways you can target those fish. But when you see an isolated boulder with a, with a stack of fish sitting behind it, that's when I'd pick up the drop shot. Like, yeah, I can bring a lot of baits by that boulder. I can put a Domeki on there, whatever. But if I wanted to truly sit there and not move, but be neutrally buoyant like the GLF products are, I can get that drop shot right there, let that mana be off the bottom. And even though the current's moving, my bait is not. I dead stick that. I try to leave a little slack in my line. And I think one of the, I hate even saying this. I, I feel like one of the things people do really wrong up here when fishing deep is their leader line. It's not, to me, it's, I mean, what, an eight pound leader, whatever, but the length of your leader totally dictates what kind of control you have over that bait, especially if you're going to fish it 50 foot deep. So if you're targeting a boulder 50 foot deep, and you have an eight foot leader, 10 foot leader, I don't care what it is. If it's less than 50 foot, it's grabbing your braided line and it is pulling your bait to some level. The more braid you got in the water, the more it's pulling your bait. So if you truly need your bait to sit still and you're fishing 50 foot deep, guess what length leader I think you should have? You should have a 50 foot leader because you don't understand how much braid gets pulled by current and wind and everything else. So hmm. I a lot of people lose the ability to control their bait down deep here because their leader length is too short. You're talking about not the leader length from the hook to the drop shot weight. You're talking about the braid to fluorocarbon leader length. Yep. And yeah, you might have to sniff off 60 foot of, of fluorocarbon because it gets twisted up or whatever at the end of your day or whatever. But to me, I gain more control over my bait because I've got fluorocarbon under the water instead of braid in a currented situation, trying to keep my weight to stay put. So let me ask you a question. Why not just go to a heavier weight? Ah, so I also, it works. Like you could go to a half ounce or even three quarter, I guess, if you want, or five eighths. But I think rate of fall is important still. I still, still, I still feel like a fast rate of fall sometimes triggers more bites or triggers less bites. But I feel like that heavier weight gets hung up way more than I like. And there's a lot of times that you want your bait to naturally be flowing with the current on those drifts. So I think there's a time and a place for that heavier drop shot weight. Gotcha. But Kyle's asking, he said, but isn't braid smaller diameter so there would be actually less drag than the fluorocarbon? Except it yeah. floats. It floats. That's the problem. It floats. And I, I, in my mind, I feel like if it's in, if it's in current, it's like being in wind. So if you ever cast a loopy line of braid in the wind, mm -hmm. or you throw a top water, watch it just drag that braid and just take it and just pull your bait all across the surface. Whereas if you're throwing fluorocarbon or something, you know, that won't happen. That's how, that's how it works in my mind. I so you're basically running straight fluoro. In a in a sense, or are you getting the bait so far out that you're still using the braid to reduce stretch? Literally, my my braid to fluorocarbon knot oftentimes is sitting in the tip of my rod because I'm fishing like 50 foot deep and I've got a little slant in it. And I'll have like 60 foot a liter on it. So you're fishing with straight flora? Yeah, basically fishing with straight flora. Okay, interesting. I know a couple other guys who are all in on that. They swear by it. Yeah. They change it every single night. Yep. And they'll go straight fluoro for smallmouth. I also know guys who will literally tie a uh, barrel knot to their drop shot leader, and it'll be high-vis gold to <laughs> your hook. And I'm like, 
that doesn't look right either. I, so, yeah, I know that bothers me. <laughs> I think the coolest thing about our sport is how everybody can be their own artist. We can come up with our own theories and our own techniques. And it's really, at the end of the day, it's what makes us confident in ourselves. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we can share our ideas and thoughts and people might think we're crazy. People might get on board with it, but at the end of the day, if it well, makes you've got their results. I mean, look at their results. I mean, you got the, the proof is in the, what is the saying, Frank? Pudding. The proof, the proof is, in the is in the pudding. Pudding. Yeah. Or where you guys are from pudding. Yeah. <laughs> so how, l- let me ask you this as far as your background. So I feel like, uh, there's a lot of people who they're like, I'm not a small mouth guy. You see a lot of guys on tour like that who are just like, Oh, I just have to survive up North. Other guys are, then there's guys who are small mouth guys here. Like how the hell did that guy like figure it out? Are you, are you like, how did you end up from down here where we have like Murray, Arbuckle, Texoma, and used to have you to, to Champlain being your favorite lake in the world and St. Uh, Lawrence River being your second favorite place in the world. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, uh, you know, growing up, I fished ten killer quite a bit. Before. Yeah, ten killer. Ten killer's got a lot of small within it, but they definitely behave totally different. But for me, like catching a smallmouth has always been like such a cool thing, like above and beyond a large mouth. So when I was young, if we did catch a brown one, it was like, oh my gosh, what a cool, <laughs> yes. beautiful awesome and they're twice as strong and they're twice like it almost like, <laughs> held it to this like dude i remember weighing one in on you follow that was smaller than a large mouth i caught in the like thunderbird wednesday night championship just because we wanted to weigh in a small mouth yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm not kidding i believe it you wanted to show people and uh when I was growing up, my dad and I, we used to take this trip down Elk River in Missouri, upstream of Grand Lake, Elk River, like Knoll, Missouri. and Which is and, why there aren't smallmouth in Grand, because there are smallmouth in the Elk River. Right. And they're river strain. They're never going to get big or whatever. They're long, lengthy fillers. But we would float. We'd, I, I call them He-Man trips. We'd float like 20, 30 miles, and we'd just stop somewhere in the river that night, camp, burn a fire, boil crawdads that we caught under rocks, stick a stick in a goggle eye, cook him till his eyeball pops, flip him, cook him till his other eyeball pops, <laughs> and get back on the river. But we did that solely to catch smallmouth, dragging little Jean the Rue salt crawls on the bottom. And it, for me, growing up, it was the best trip ever because it was almost all smallmouth. And so I've always loved them. So you fast forward into making my way up north, where literally it is the mecca of smallmouth. Mm-hmm. Is so enthralled with it, I just had to figure out how to do it well. Like it, it was just I wanted to do it more than anything, and maybe that's yeah. where I'm going to place. I also think, for whatever reason, God makes us all different. But like, I feel like I understand them. Like yeah. when I think. Small mouth's probably going to do this. It seems to be right. And so it starts to build confidence in you. And I, I told Frank this uh, on another call that, like, I think spotted bass and smallmouth have a lot in common in a weird way as far as, like, how I predict how a bass will behave. I think I, I think spotted bass are kind of predictable in my mind a lot like smallmouth is. But largemouth, man, they they trick my butt a lot. So I just don't, I just don't like them as much. <laughs> Look at this, Frank. I know you haven't seen this and you guys can't see this, but this is Kyle's top tens, impressive 13 top tens. And it starts off, you know, I'm sure it was Toyotas and BFLs, Arkansas River, Rayburn, Arkansas River, Fort Gibson, Fort Gibson, brutal tournament. Like there should never be a major tournament on Fort Gibson. Does not handle pressure, is small. It's, I despise that as a big field tournament like anywhere but fort gibson for the love of god amistad back to fort gibson there's some spots at loo am i wrong kyle am i wrong i know you've had top tens there but it is a horrible big field multi-day tournament like probably the worst in the country man i i've only had two tournaments there and i tied for first place and i got the second place money and I got second place. So you are not going to get me to vote Fort Gibson off the list. But turn- will you not agree that it is a horrible multi-day big field venue? It's too small. It's There too you small. go. There you go. All right. Back to this. Sorry. That was a little <laughs> tangent there, Frank. You'll, 
I, well, no, you'll never see it because I won't, I won't take see there. it. No, no if the I only down, thing that I have good to say about Fort Gibson is that I hooked a freaking world record paddlefish on a 12 pound <laughs> test in a BFL 20 years ago and fought it for three hours because I knew it was a line class record. And then I hooked it in uh, uh, Jackson Bay and it broke me off on the damn bridge. That's how far I played it. Oh my gosh. It's yeah. got a big That's crap. what, a mile and a half? Yeah, every bit. It was it was blowing. I mean, it was blowing. So I was going like four miles an hour. Anyway, long story short, let's get back to this here. Uh, how do I? Do yeah, I mean, Champlain. Champlain is probably one of my favorite lakes okay. in the world. So listen to this. So right, Amistad, Fort Gibson, Lewis Smith. These are your last top tens. Champlain, twenty twenty two, eighth. Saint Lawrence River, tenth. Champlain, third. Saint Lawrence River, Champlain, Saint Lawrence River. <laughs> you have not had a non smallmouth top 10 since you did the spotted bass on Lewis Smith back in 2021. All the rest, Champlain, Thousand Island. So you know what you're talking about with the smallmouth. Yeah. And I'm scared to death to go back home and fish Oklahoma. I think I've totally forgotten how, how that might go down for me. So I don't, I wouldn't, it's not, that's not what the scary part is. What the scary part is, is that you know you ain't catching them like you are up there. <laughs> that's the right. scary part yeah i know yeah that's the minnow right here right yeah that's the minnow right there that's it so that's so that's available let me let me make sure i get this right that's available right now in the 2.75 i was catching them on the 3.25 which was an iCast release in july and will not be available is not available on the website but the exact same minnow in a smaller version is available correct Okay. Hey, do they have the flashpoint up there? Yeah, I've been showing it all show. Hey, how many skews are there? How many? Is there 12? 14, no, many? there's like 95. But I just it's saw insane. So I haven't seen them all in person. I, I The ones they had at ICAST, they must have not had them all. Hold on. Let me pull it up. All right, is there, there it is. Cool. Shop cool. early access. Look at how many colors there are. Yeah, One, so two, here. So here, I got three colors that you don't have, I think, Kyle. So let me see. This color here is copper shad. Okay, I've got that one in I've got that one in a deep diver. All so, right. How about pro pink? Do you got pro pink? No, I've got canary, which is All really right. looking color, by the way. Yeah. Hold okay. On, Frank, so, I gotta go full screen on you. All right. All right. So here's no. pro pink. So you squint at your camera. Okay, so yeah, that's that's like a pearlescent pink. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to. I got a sun glare coming in here, but yeah. it's like a, it's like a pearlescent pink. It's semi transparent. It's got the the uh, the belly's solid white pearl. This one's beautiful. I don't know if I've ever seen a better lineup in jerkbait colors than what is present with these flashpoint. It, it's insane. Every one of them I grab, I like start to drool, and I want to go well, top on. That's a hundred percent what happened to me when I went and got them. So, th and this one is Vegas, which is another color that I really like a lot. That's the gold one. I couldn't remember the color of it. I have it, and I already taken out of the pack. So, yeah, Matt, you'll these have a gold blade. Yes, in the head. Silver blade. So there is there is a difference in some of the colors. Okay, so there's pictures. This is a conundrum. There's pictures on lure net of 25 different colors uh, on the, the color point? yes the color options are 12 you think that is there multiple pictures of the same color just a different look or I don't yeah know. they do they have two pictures of every color so what they oh, have they is do? they'll have the side image picture like this and then they yeah, have yeah 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 like that i'm sorry folks and that's the copper Copper shiner. Yeah, color? this is this is another color that I like a lot. Yeah, yeah you're I caught right. them on that already. Yeah, I've already caught some on that. See, I, I have I have uh I have some lakes that I fish that are really, really, really color sensitive. And so <laughs> when I see something that I need, I know what lake it's for. You know what I mean? Yeah. it's I, The other thing I think it's before I forget is I have to talk about these hooks, Matt. Like, if you're a jerkbait angler, hooks 
you find are like the most important thing to you. Like for years, in fact, every year I'm asking other people about what is your favorite jerk bait hook? What do you find success in? Because inevitably I go through like these phases where I fall in love with the Ichikawas or the G finesse or the, you know, what, what the, like that, like the nano, the nano treble was really doing well. But then you lose a few in a row or something, and all of a sudden your confidence is just shot. It's just, it's just the craziest thing. But it for me, it is what happens with a jerk bait. So I've never used these hooks before. And they're BKK hooks. So, Matt, I don't know if you've used BKK hooks before. Yeah. I am mind blown how good these work on these, like, violent smallmouth up here. Like, that first day I was telling you about, like, this is the jerk bait that caught them all. These hooks. There is one hook in the middle treble that I rolled a little, that finally rolled a little bit, and I tried to sharpen it. The other eight are like sharp as lightning, tacky. They're not torqued. They're not bent. I've had, I've not had to bend them back in place yet. This jerkbait alone has already done its job. He should be able to be retired, as far as I'm concerned, from a jerkbait standpoint. It doesn't sink, and the hooks are still incredible. Like, it, it's it blew my mind. I shot forty minutes worth of fish catches the other day on them, and I'm just torquing on them. I anchor mode in the current, and I'm like wrenching them up into the current, four and five pounders, like trying to pull the hooks free, trying to straighten the hook out, trying to bend them, just to put like the end user in a place of confidence that the hooks hang on to big smallmouth even in current. It's they're really impressive. I was trying to th figure out. They're are they Japanese hooks? I don't know who I. All I know is it says they're BKK hooks. Yeah. I think KK might be Japanese. Yeah, I'm not I'm sure. Buddy of mine BKK said today. Me. Today BKK counts on factory employees some 600 strong. An office in Japan and an office in Shanghai managing international sales and branding. Uh, Europe, China, Southeast Asia. Yeah, they've made a big impact in the industry recently. Yeah, I have a buddy of mine that sent me some of those hooks a long time ago to look at. Um, and I was pretty impressed with them, but I only had four hooks. And so I never really, you know, went out to make an order for them. But they were pretty impressive. And the fact that they're on these, is, these jerk baits, is pretty good because now I don't have to buy a jerk bait and change all the hooks out all the time. You 100%. This is going to be the first jerk bait that I pull out of the box and throw it out there, tournament ready to go. And I have the utmost confidence the hooks aren't going to be what fails me if I lose the fish. Uh, all right. I'll throw this up one more time. We've talked a lot about it. Then we're going to let Kyle get back to catching walleye. So he hasn't mentioned this, but he's been very gracious with his time, Frank, because. Uh, you're on a mega school of giant walleye and you had to leave them with your buddy catching seven to eight pounders every single cast to come do this show. Oh my God. It was in <laughs> Frank wouldn't be here, Kyle. The last thing Frank, what a did, showed. The last thing we did is he he hooked into one and he's like, Oh, it's a big one. And I see it. And I'm literally reeling mine in, and then I get a bite. I was like, Oh, mine's bigger. And we're fighting these two, like, eight-pound walleyes the boat. And we only got one Bubba net. And so, like, I net his. And he's like, what are you going to do with yours? I was like, let's net them both. He's like, I got a video of this. So he starts videoing. And we're catching them on Flash Mob Juniors, dude. Giant walleye just crushing them. 20-pound fluorocarbon, 7-foot-10 heavy. Just give them the business, dude. And I, I, I literally net. Two eight-pound walleye. Actually, they weighed like seven seventies or something. Two big walleye with two flash mob juniors, ten hooks because we ain't in the tournament no more, and it's a five-hook state, in New York. And they're in there just flopping around, just catastrophe, dude. <laughs> and uh, we already, you know, we, we've already had our limit, and we're just catching, releasing, having fun. Uh, and then I, I caught like a five eighty smallmouth mixed in the school. A buddy of mine, like, deep dives here, like, free dives, not deep dives, free dives. And he swims around down there, like, 20-plus foot deep. I don't know how he gets that deep. Like, I think my ears would bleed. But, like, he gets down there, like, 20-plus foot deep and videotapes all of this stuff. Crazy what he tells me he sees. I mean, the, literally the schools, it's just 
a community of fish down there. It's drum, walleye, smallmouth. Everything is just coexisting down there. Small, small, smallmouth, big, smallmouth. They're not grouped up in size, and they're just coexisting down there. So it, it makes it hard if you're a bass fisherman, you know, when you see a school of fish, telling yourself they're one species or the other, and you got this buddy you're saying, no, it's all of them. So, like, now I see a school of 20, I'm like, I wonder how many are smallmouth, you know, like right, right. smallmouth and eight drum. And like, because if it's a school of drum, I feel like it's easy to tell. But when there's like a pack of 20 or 30 on the backside of a ledge 50 foot deep, you can't tell. You just know that there's fish separation on the bottom or on the backside of the current seam. And it, it's really neat to know that they just coexist like that. You would I don't know. I've always been a narrow minded and thought it's the fish I'm after no matter what, but. No, that's called positive thinking. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like scuba diving in an aquarium. So I, I literally found this school of fish like two, three weeks ago, and I caught a couple of really big smallmouth in it. And they're so far away that I didn't end up fishing them in the tournament. But but I told my buddy that I thought we could maybe catch twenty five to thirty pounds of smallmouth there based on what I'd seen. And I hadn't touched I'll them. Be right there. So we get there and I find them I'm like, there they are, dude. And they look, dude, I get them to come up and look at a jerk bait. And I was like, dude, they're acting like walleye. You know, walleye, they get up on a jerk bait kind of slow and you twitch the jerk bait and then they kind of slow. And it don't matter what the speed of the current is or nothing. Then walleye are just kind of slow. And they weren't doing any of the smallmouth stuff. I was like, dude, I know these were smallmouth. Like I caught them. I was like, but these are acting like walleye. I was like, maybe they'll eat the A-Rig. Maybe they'll eat the Flash Mob Jr. Dude, we pick it up and roll it over that shoal. <laughs> it's like, dude, they just rip it out. of They rip the whole rod out of your hands, dude. Like, and it, I don't know. We actually had our, we were actually tired of it. Like, he was kind of glad we were done because it wears you plumb out. And then you've got this mess to deal with at the yeah. end. And you're kind of like, you want to just go catch some smallmouth for a little while? <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it's, it's, a, it's awesome, man. It's awesome. Small, funny story. First of all, he got a ticket. He, I picked him up in the airport and he was so excited. I picked him up with the boat. We're just going fishing. I picked him up at 3 p.m. He wants to maximize his time. We get out in the water. We're fishing this spot and I hear him go, I'm about to get a ticket. I went, huh? And he, I kind of heard him. I was like, what we're no no we're not gonna get a ticket and this guy pulls up on us police whatever officially he checks us and in the middle of looking at my license my buddy just goes i don't have a license and then i realized what he said he literally said i'm gonna get a ticket i thought he was joking like we were gonna but he literally knew he's gonna get a ticket because he forgot to buy a license so it was pretty cool the guy was cool he said it's gonna be anywhere between zero and 250 dollars depending on what they decide when you go it's almost like a speeding ticket you like go to court with it or not go to court, but you can go to the courthouse and pay or something. Anyway, he tried to do that just now and they're closed for the Labor Day weekend. So now he doesn't know still if it's zero or $250, but he has his license now. And, uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how that goes for him. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's so funny. The biggest, you're in the biggest body of water on the planet and you get pulled over. <laughs> yeah. 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 He said he'd, he, I don't know. He said he forgot. I ain't so sure if he just wasn't trying to uh, roll the dice, but he said he forgot. So how long are you there for? You just like learning, getting better at it, hanging out, like you said with with the wife up there. Yeah, uh, I'm here till September 12th. So my buddy, oh God, <laughs> oh, it's a long time, Kyle. Oh, oh yeah, oh. dude. Uh, oh, that's what I was gonna say. So my buddy, he was he wanted walleye so bad that. On his plane, he brought a personal item and a, and a carry-on. And his personal item is a soft-sided cooler with nothing in it. Because he read, you can transport frozen meat. And he's literally, we're literally going to freeze these fillets in Ziploc bags. And he's got like 12 hours worth of flying to do. But it's literally going to be a soft-sided cooler with just frozen walleye fillets in it. And he's just going to be carrying it around. All the airports with no dry eyes, no nothing. That's going to slowly be melting the whole oh. trip. And I can't oh. wait to see how it turns out for him. Yeah, it's going to be problematic for him. 12 hours in a soft side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I told him, keep it on the floor. Don't put it in the overhead anyway. People oh, start getting water dripping. Do you get trouble. the cheek meat out, Kyle? Oh, so I've done that several times, Matt. 
and I'll be honest, I don't know if it's worth the effort required. Yes, to- it is a hundred percent. It's think- criminal to throw the, especially if you're, if you're uh, like, I've always said with walleye, the bigger they are, I think the genetics are more tasty and the <laughs> cheek meat. When you get a big wall, I'll get like three walleye anglers that are like, screw you. Uh, <laughs> uh, you got to do the cheek meat. You have to it, you, that it, dude in a, in a four pound walleye. It's the size of a scallop. You literally oh, yeah. just take your knife and just go droop, and then you grab it and then peel it off with your, Right. Hand. Like it's the easiest thing ever. It looks all like pearl. It looks like yeah, like yeah. Thing. And then you don't do it regular. Light, light, uh, light. One egg, a little bit of whole milk. Get a li- and then light flour on either side. Hand salt and pepper it, and then you want to melt uh Irish butter in a pan, but put a little bit of uh, oil down first because the uh, burning point oil is higher. It'll keep the butter from burning. And then you want to saute those like a scallop. So you don't want to overdo them or else they get rubbery. So you want to do them just lightly on either side until they're light brown. Pull them off paper towel. Hit them with a shot of lemon. A little bit of salt. A little bit of pepper on top of it. It is the best appetizer in the history of food. Or or oh. you could go back to the one of the old episodes and get my walleye cheek chowder recipe. Oh, but you need to catch a lot of walleyes and have a lot of cheeks. Well, the, dude, the size of the walleye they're catching, and then I dice them up real small, it, so it's like clams, and it's you make it like clam chowder. Only it's walleye cheek chowder. You should get a ticket if you don't keep the cheek meat, Kyle. Like <laughs> you literally just take it and you just do it right around it, and then it pulls right off of the skit. Like it's just like you're peeling it, a, peeling an apple. I understand. I understand the concept. I don't think you peel an apple like that, but I understand what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> what do I? What What do we do this like that? <laughs> a peach. I mean, maybe a maybe peach. I do. A peach is a way yeah. better. Apple yeah, yeah, yeah. Take this, yeah. Or First an time, avocado. Apple yeah. Put off an apple. I throw. You better throw the damn apple away. But <laughs> <laughs> I got it because I probably eat. I have to eat as much, if not more fish than like 98% of the world. There's no doubt. I live on, I live in a fifth wheel down by every river and every lake. And that's all I eat is fish. My wife gets so tired of me putting more fish in the freezer. She's like, it's full already. I don't have room for my ice, you know, or whatever. But what is so much better? Like I understand a yellow perch, the, the taste of a filet of a yellow perch to me is way beyond the flavor of any other f- piece of meat agree. out there. I agree. On a flathead, I'm a big noodler. I love hand fishing. On a flathead, the belly meat on a flathead is way beyond the better than any flavor of any other part of the flathead or any other fish in Oklahoma. It beats crappie, dude. It beats mm-hmm. crappie and walleye in Oklahoma, hands down, the belly meat of a flathead catfish. But when I eat the, the jowl or the cheek of a walleye, I've yet to notice that 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 is different than like the shoulder of the walleye like you're telling me you you lick that cheek muscle and you're like it's like it does that to you it's good it's totally different it's like a scallop it's a freshwater scallop all right but i will agree with you now on your perch are you a skin on and scale guy or will you just straight fillet him and I take this okay i play everything except like i've been having fun like trying like stuff on the half shell like i i took some smith lake striper like a couple of small ones like six seven pounders and i literally cooked them on the half shell like in my air fryer just to try something fun and different you know um, but for the most part i play everything yeah, what about skin- you, Frank? Are you a sk- do you keep your skin on your perch? Um, I sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Bluegill, I'll I'll scale them and eat the skin on a bluegill. There you so go. So that's a bass cat live well, Kyle. So it was the final oh, yeah. day of it was the final day of practice at Champlain for that bass nation. I was trying to find the winning pattern and I came across these things and they were 12 and a half to 14 inch yellow Monster. perch. Yes. And I was done practicing at that point. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. I came in 
<laughs> with about 15 of them and just feasted. Do you ever eat the eggs of the yellow perch? No, you can do that, Frank? Yeah, I br- I got I got a bunch of perch. I brought them home and um my mom said, "Did you clean them yet?" And I said, "No, I'm about to." And she goes, "Bring the bring the eggs to me." And I said, "Okay." So I saved all the all the row sacks, brought them over to her, and she goes, "I'm going to cook some of these up. Don't go anywhere." And they, yeah. Uh, yeah, dude. And they and they were phenomenal. They were just phenomenal. by themselves, lightly yep. floured and breaded. Lightly floured, that's it. And they were wow. good. So deep fried. They were fried. Yeah, she 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 fried them in a pan. She lightly breaded them. She didn't put eggs on them or nothing. She just soaks them in cold water, shake them off, throw them in the flour, and then fried them up in a pan with a little bit of oil. Hey, somebody just called me a fish bonker. What is a fish bonker? It means that you eat fish. You're not like one of the guys who refuses to, like you. Oh. <laughs> when you catch one, you want to keep your wacky bonker. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what I took it to me. Yeah. yeah. I like, wa- like walleyes, like I'll. I keep the walleyes between two and three and a half pounders. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I catch those big eight pounders. I can't. I I like the smaller ones better. I can't yeah. eat them big sloppy like ones. Crappie. I understand that. Like if I catch a two and a half pound crappie or bigger, like I yeah, always. I'm the, I'm the same way with the crappie. Yeah. Maybe but, I mean, I, am I walleye thing wrong by keeping all these. Seven- I can, I can attest that. No. So. When I was there, I just went to Thousand Islands this year, fun fishing, Kyle. And I caught an 813 out of 55 feet of water. Yep. And when it came out, it didn't have its air bladder. It had its stomach in its throat. Oh, wow. And I tried to release it. And I mean, it was belly up, drifting with the current, limp. So, yeah. I mean, I didn't have an option. I would yep. have released it if I could. Yep. It was pretty damn good. Oh, dude. So, I'm fizzing. <laughs> I'm fizzing all I like as soon as I catch them, I'm fizzing them just like smallmouth and they're going to the bottom of my live well and just loving life. That was a whole nother topic I'd love to do sometime is the whole fizzing deal. I've been on a big kick about trying to push that conservation effort and and get the barb Elliot up here and, and Yeah, I mean fizzing fizzing the smallmouth is very important. Um I hate to see the smallmouth die for nothing. Um you know, it's just it's the fishery where you're at right now you say is is just so huge and and it won't get impacted because of the small season time for them but i saw it happen here i saw the impact here and it was twofold there was two reasons for it one at the time if you can believe it or not at the time the walleye fishery was in decline and so the charter captain started targeting the smallmouths because they, they were there were billions of them up here. Um, yeah. So the charter guys started targeting smallmouth, um, and then of course all the tournament trails started coming up here, and there were tournament trails every weekend up here, two hundred plus boats every weekend. Um, it got this fishery today is nowhere near as good as it was eight years ago not even close um it's coming back in certain areas um but so when i see you know the guys they post their stuff and they're like yeah 45 feet 50 feet um you hope they're fizzing them you hope they're taking care of them because the delayed mortality rate on a smallmouth especially in the warm months is insanely high yeah. So, so I agree with you, Kyle. Hundred percent. I feel like a lot of the northern anglers are real adamant about it. They they know mm-hmm. how. They they they're they're passionate about it. They do it just with that instinctively. When I come up here and I draw co anglers, they got their needle. They stick it in the carpet by my boat, and they're poking the fish as soon as they catch it. Like it, it's just understood up here. But you get anglers like me that have had to go through kind of a weird learning curve. You know, through the throw, the big bends mean mender needle and you kill some fish every now and then because you miss by a quarter inch and you said same way vital to a fish uh, the blood flow and everything goes around the gullet of the fish everything everything that you could kill the fish with and the blood flow is centered around the throat and the gullet you can successfully fizz a fish in the throat and get really good at it but you're going to kill several before you figure out how to do that and the last thing you want to do is start teaching people that way when there is a much 
safer, less risky way to do it. And I've got some really cool pictures. I'll send to you. We should do this. Some, I've got some pictures uh, of some dissected bass that, that died from barrel trauma, not being fizzed. The air bladder consumes, yes, Barb's fish kit. I've got some cool, uh, Barb dissected some fish, Matt, and I've got some awesome pictures of what those fish look like when they're not fizzed. And it tells the whole story. And it also tells you how it's safe it is to fizz them in the side. There's nothing you can hit. It is, you go under scale, you go through skin, muscle, and air bladder. You can, you cannot hurt that fish. You cannot kill that fish. All you can do is help that fish survive by putting it on that landmark that she shows in that sheet. And when you're going through the throat, it's just so high risk. I, you, should, you need to quit doing it. Don't use the big needles. No. Nope. Uh, fizz them in the side. And the second you do it one time with somebody that shows you how, you'll be so thankful because you're going to appreciate keeping a fish alive that you love. Like if you're an angler, dude, you want these fish – and every fish I weighed in at the St. Lawrence River needed to be fizzed and got fizzed within the first five minutes of being caught, if not before I even stood up to make another cast. Every one of my fish came in black, tiger-striped. I'm talking violent, like grab them by the lip and they shake and <laughs> I pull them out of the live well. And prior, in the prior years when I first got up here, man, I had the big men's mender needle. Uh, they didn't have the plunger. That plunger's a big deal to be able to keep that thing clean. You stick it in the fish and no air comes out because it got clogged and you pull it out, you stick it again, again, again. Next thing you know, uh, you don't have any confidence in yourself. So you go through the throat and then you hit something in the throat. So it, there's a lot to it, but it's very simple and you need to learn how to do it. And there literally, I made a video with Barb on my YouTube channel and we fished fish and we talked about it. And she's so smart. And she's so involved and 70 years old and donates so much time and her money just trying to teach people how. And yeah, I actually saw that video. It's insanely informative. It's a great video. It's great. Um, she has the normal mishaps anybody would. The fish moves. She sticks a scale. The fish flops around with the needle in it. The fish is fine. It doesn't hurt the fish. Right. All things is going to happen to everybody. But what was really cool of it is a guy, I think, that knows how to build websites and stuff, reached out to her after that, and she he just built her a website where it's really easy to get on and order needles from. And and uh, you might could Google it and find it. I don't know off the top of my head. If I could use my phone, I'd tell you. But I think it's like barbsbestfishkits.com. And she's, mm -hmm. so before, it was really hard to find Barb. You, didn't, you, you heard about her. She was the fizz lady. You had to find a buddy that had her contact info, and she would quickly send it to you, but then you had to PayPal or Venmo or, yeah, that's the video. Yeah. And, it, dude, I learned so much that day. We The third fish in that video was sitting right side up in the in the live well, but it was at the surface. Like, its back was kind of out of the water, but it looked fine. She's like, nah, this is the one that people miss. Like, that fish needs to be fizzed. It's struggling, and it's, you know... Uh, but the pictures that I saw, that air bladder consumes all the way back to the anal pore, all the way up to their throat, and it basically suffocates all the other organs. The heart can't pump. Nothing good can happen to that fish. The second you put it in the live well, that fish is slowly dying. It's suffocating itself. And what happens is the heart doesn't pump its full arrhythmia anymore. The pH gets off, and it poisons the whole fish. It poisons itself because the oxygen level throws off the pH. And I know a lot of big-name anglers, to be honest bring five fish to the scales and they don't fizz them. And they say, I've never lost one. I'm like, yeah, but you're going to, that fish is dead, man. Like you yeah. caused long-term trauma to that fish's heart and other organs that, yeah, it may have been classified as a live fish when you brought it in, but the fish didn't make it, man. And there, those, those guys, want, I had that conversation with somebody at this last event and I basically, you're in denial. If you think that you, you did your part, as an angler, especially one that people might look up to, you, you need to take the time to learn how to do this. It's real simple. And if you want to protect this resource and all the anglers need to, especially the ones that are in limelight, uh, just take the time to learn how to do this, dude. Save the fish, man. It's really simple. And it's really right. cool. It's the most rewarding thing ever. If you've ever had the opportunity to bring an animal back to life or save an animal's life in any scenario, it's a rewarding feeling immediately. Yeah, I mean it's it, the video's good. It's very it's very informative. It shows you literally everything you need to know. Um it's not complicated. The, you know, the the thing too is that like a lot of a lot of the tackle shops around um don't carry fizz kits. Um it's kind of a pain in the neck item for them or I don't know why they don't carry them. 
Um, I was at a local tackle shop the other day, uh, Fisherman Central. If anyone's from, you know, the Cleveland, Akron, Canton area, um, they they actually had fizz kits with the needle insert and everything in them. So uh, it, for you guys that are going to go out and catch these deep fish, if you don't have a fizz kit, you need to get one. And Barb's got a website too, right? Where they mail them out to you. Yeah. This wasn't very easy. You couldn't order them. You couldn't pay for them or nothing. You still had to reach out to her and do a Venmo thing. But literally, like last week, a guy was messaging me. He built her a website right now. And I think it's like barbsbestbizkit.com or something like that. And he built it for it. It's phenomenal. It's so easy. It shows all this stuff. In fact, it has pictures, Matt, on there uh, that I was telling you about, about the dissected fish. You can see what it looks like when a fish suffering from barrel trauma is not released. You can see how it completely just leaves no room for the other organs to function it literally does not leave any room for it so it's a really cool website if i'd have been more prepared i'd have seen a link for it because it might be hard to find something. i'm looking for it yeah <laughs> matt matt can find anything <laughs> there's I've a learned. lot of uh, a lot of stuff here with needles and pill bottles that yeah we could get canceled i don't I don't know if I can step out of this. I think I can. Uh, he'll go. Yeah, you'll go away. I'll, I'll look for it. I'll look for it later and put the link okay. in, Kyle. Okay. You know well, what? We're going to we're gonna let you get back to fishing. You still have a couple right. uh, uh, yeah. a full afternoon. Anything else you wanted to get in here, Frank? The, bring in Kyle in. Great addition to today's show. Smallmouth. We got a little conservation in. We got <laughs> busted some myths about I mean, it was a good show today yes i'm glad no i just i had questions about an actual uh flashpoint user until i could throw one myself and put my two cents in and uh you answered a lot of the questions yeah i, I look forward to getting a phone call from you after you get to go out there and test it oh don't worry you will <laughs> all right catch him up thanks for jumping on I greatly appreciate it kyle congratulations on a great season two and winning the points in that northern division there's a lot of uh a lot of guys who've done it for a lot of years that were uh that were fishing that division thanks man i hope your sooners win today so they can go undefeated until they see the cowboys and we beat them again <laughs> ha oh don't even get me started on big 12 titles see ya adios my man thank you <laughs> that was just a low blow hey, dude he took the and he took the final the parting final shot well we got screwed with lincoln riley when they beat us because he was already headed to usc and then uh, i don't know it was just hey the good news is was... matt the season just started i'd be happy with a nine and three sooner season this year I mean, we're, we kind of got screwed in the SEC. We have the second hardest schedule. Of course, Texas got like the 13th easiest. They play like Vanderbilt 19 times. We are, we're like Alabama, LSU, Tennessee. They're like yeah. Vanderbilt, Arkansas. Yeah, Vanderbilt. Are they any good? They never were when They're I was in the up. SEC. They never were. But yeah, dude. I So, well, I'm glad you're back now. We're going to be live for, for, yeah we'll be live next thursday we'll be we should be live the next thursday after that um dude i don't know how you're functioning on zero sleep okay so i haven't shown this before but i'm going to today so you know i, I got my yeti here so i stopped i one of the cool things today wait no not today it would have been yesterday get it together <laughs> yesterday because i started driving yesterday at seven but i had to go through illinois to drop some stuff off at my buddies uh because he was my co-angler and at the open and then he flew home because i went up to canada but i flew through or good lord i drove through wisconsin and one of the things about wisconsin is they have a, be a beer by the new glarus brewing company called spotted cow yes i've had many a spotted cow I got four cases. Good for you, <laughs> so, dude. It's so I hate. came home. I got. I put one in the freezer. I chilled it out, and I've been having a little spotted cow. You have to show. understand that reason that that is that is it's because that is literally the only place they sell it. They do not ship it. They do not sell it. They do not have it anywhere. You have to purchase or consume it in uh, in Wisconsin if you're going to correct. Try. And, and uh, I, I did a trade show there, and and I myself came home with uh, 
several containers of spotted cow. Yeah. Uh, I, I got to take care of some business and then I'll be on the couch. Hopefully I can make it through the entire game before I, uh, before I fall asleep. Oh, but, and you're going to, uh, you're going to sleep, dude. Listen, a cool new, uh, jerk bait on the market from, uh, Booyah. from lure net, uh, code is BTL capital BTL 24, 15% off. Uh, you can get on the website and, uh, be the first people to get that. There were a couple questions. It's available now, right now. Uh, the 3.25 GLF, uh, drop minnow one of the things kyle didn't mention about that that i thought was important see i was thinking he was talking about leader length yeah I and did too. Uh, i did too. and what was important for me at leech now i caught uh six of my fish on something else but i caught three on that glf uh 3.25 drop minnow and smelt and i used a really small number one gamagatsu drop shot split shot hook and I am fully believe that one of the reasons was I was on high pressure, high pressured lake, low fish population was I could cast it next to the rock and I could let it go completely slack. And that minnow stayed neutrally buoyant. Yeah. hundred. And that was when Dan was literally on talking about the neutral buoyancy and why it, uh, and why it worked so well. And then I could barely move it and you could, I knew that tail was just quivering because it wasn't like they would follow it down and eat it. It's like you'd cast it next to the boulder and then you'd see them swim over to it. Yeah. They just kind of appear on it. Yeah. Yeah. So. And the thing the the cool thing about that is um, any movement in the water makes that bait quiver. And, and it's made out of that weird plastic and the nose doesn't rip out after one freaking fish. No, it's, it's I literally that- had two packs. I gave three of them to a buddy and I used four in two days and still had an eight pack. Yeah, I, I, I was. That was the one thing that surprised me about that bait is how durable it was. I was beside myself when I fished them. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can catch a shit ton of fish on them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That should be their slogan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could Why be. Why not? Hey, it worked for a hot sauce. Yeah outstanding well nice to have you back but yeah now i gotta get my life together thanks for jumping on this i know uh you did what ike show yeah this this morning and we wound up going over i almost almost had to cut because i looked at my my uh phone was it live or is it going to be out later it's going to be out later i think i hope it was it was a good show we reminisced about a lot of uh a lot of old time stuff that that we've done um stuff that we talked a lot about a lot of things tournament trails about all kinds of stuff uh told some stories it was fun it was it was a good time but the time flew um and i didn't realize it and he's like oh we've been on almost for two hours i'm like you're in your third hour right now yeah three straight hours of live streaming not like like non-stop like i got literally got off with him and jumped right on with you guys because almost Almost missed it. Well, go watch some college football. Pour yourself a cold one. Uh, one more question. Someone did ask. Uh, end of the month next week, will you be revealing the September Thursday, Frank Scaler? Yeah. So next Thursday, you'll be revealing the drop. Yeah. Can Thursday. you can you tease it without getting in trouble? I I'm an idiot because I have it downstairs and I was going to bring it up and show it, but. Uh, this pattern is going to be, it's a wounded bait fish pattern called wounded threadfin. Ooh. How, how's that for a tease? <laughs> I like it. They'll be available. I, uh, Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. And I'll, I'll have it to show on air Thursday morning. Isn't that wild how a dude from Oklahoma can go up there and it like clicks? Yeah. Um, like that, I feel more comfortable up north than... Because it's because anywhere it, else. Yeah, well, it fishes your style, man. Yeah. Um, and that was before forward facing sonar. Right. Same here. Same here. Um, Champlain's one of my all time favorite lakes. It's such a diverse fishery. I've caught smallmouth no two ways the same time every time I fished it. Um, and it's just it's so much it's so much fun. And um, you know, I I was on I was at 
St. Lawrence a long time ago. I'm talking decades and decades ago. Um, I was a young, young kid. I don't, you know, and, and didn't know enough back then to, to next summer. Can we do a, can we do yeah, a trip? hundred percent. We'll do some shows and uh, videos and stuff from there. Yeah. Because we're going to, we're going to talk about that too. We're going to, we're going to do some cool different stuff um, for day four and, uh, I, and we'll, we'll make it work. I think, I think we'll have the ability. One of the things that we are doing is a call and a uh, some lures and a drawing for the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame auction again. That yes. in the coming weeks we'll have more uh, more info on that. And then when do you, when do you need to know about? Well, the what? auction is the twenty sixth, so I probably need to know in the next week or two so they can get it on the website. The twenty sixth of September. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. So I got. You could literally pull any drawing out to the side and just a couple oh, no. painted lures. No, no, no. This ain't going to be a drawing. I got, I got four custom colors painted and autographed by me. Um, really? Yeah. You have them already? I have them in the basement. Okay. Um, yeah. No. Uh, send them to me. I, and I'll I just shadow one, box them. I have one more to paint. Send them to me and I'll shadow box them. And instead of doing all four, we'll do four separate auctions so there's four people that have a chance to get one and all the proceeds go to the bass fishing hall of fame okay that's fine with me but i'm my thought process was that collection of four would be okay yeah we'll just do one with four then it's your deal i i mean because i because yeah because my thought process was you'll have a four set crayfish collection oh yeah no a hundred percent that would be yeah that's and all the listeners, anybody can bid on it. It's on uh, Bid Pal, uh, and I'll have the link as soon as that goes live. It's the same thing we've done. I'm also doing the BTL experience uh, where you get to come in, spend the night, jump on BTL in the morning, in the winter, This, and then we'll go out and try to catch 30 pounds of largemouth or yeah. two and a half pounds of crappie, depending on what it was, whatever you want to do. Right, and then the person that bids on on the lures will get a guest spot on day yeah, four get to jump on day four with us yeah that'll be great yeah but yeah i was gonna surprise you with it i didn't realize it was coming up so soon i'm glad i painted them before yeah no that's fantastic yeah i just got one more to go and i and i'm almost done with it they look so good god almighty do they look good man <laughs> i don't even want to sign them <laughs> oh, you got to sign it'll, it. I know, but it'll ruin them, man. I don't want to put my is name this, on it. Is this an autographed picture that will be available for the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame auction? <laughs> no. Like, I could just see Frank Scalish XOXO no. underneath <laughs> that. <laughs> no, no. And you know what? I had a picture of you, Matt. Somebody sent me uh, when you were a kid, and I was gonna, I was going to get you back. Yeah, but here that doesn't work because that's clearly making fun of me, and you look like a badass in this picture. So this is actually. Oh yeah, no, yours would have been definitely being made fun of. You look like. Yeah, this is not making fun of you. This is like this guy is a badass. He's here to party. Guy. He's here to catch fish. Dude, He's big... here to do it with big line and a heavy rod. Oh yeah, in my champion mean fifteen. <laughs> I swear to God, I swear to God, dude, I swear to God, the picture the kid that I forget who sent it to me, you, you look like the Bucky's beaver logo. Oh, thank you. In it. I didn't, I, it, I literally it, just said, do you look like a badass? And you said, I look like Bucky the beaver. No, in the picture he sent me, you're, you're like a child of God knows how old you are. Oh um, yeah. It doesn't surprise me that freaking drunk would be the one he sent it to you. Oh, that's. <laughs> It was. Why am I not surprised? (laughs) It was drunk with. Oh my god, that is so funny. But yeah, but I I don't know what I did with it. It's probably in my cloud floating around somewhere. I was say I was saving it as ammo for for uh, for whatever giving. I mean, I don't have anything badass like this. Like, there's nothing to me like riding an ostrich or like wrangling. Uh, you know what I mean? Like doing something cool. Like, I mean, I was I played hockey. Hey, hold, hold that picture upright. Oh, no, I that's the islands. Okay. I thought that might have been. That's oh, the islands. Thank I, God. I thought you were about to tell me to put the picture down because there was something in the background. You didn't want people to know where you were. Oh, no, no. I, it looked like this spot I fished on Kentucky Lake. 
And um, but it's not, it's the islands. All right, we're cool. <laughs> I might incorporate so I'm getting the boat wrap next couple weeks again. Um, because I just haven't been home to do it. I would love to put that on the wrap somehow. You need to put BTL all over that wrap. That would be a good I feel like that would be a good portion of the wrap. I, I, I'm saying no, Matt. No. Um uh, cap capital BTL twenty four. Please don't forget to use that because that's that that's how they decide whether it's worth it or not. I don't know. I feel like I was all over the map today. No, dude. This this was a hard show to do today. Um I, I was a little lost. Um Mike and I were talking about so many different things. I had a I had a game plan set up for today's show, which actually went right to the trash. So remember that little hamburger I drew, that black and white. See, hamburger? I feel like I wasn't on my A game. I was pissing Nancy Zipper off. <laughs> to well, which I responded, I often piss myself off too. <laughs> there you go. Go get a burger. Go get a burger and fries. Did you do that during the show today? No, I did. I did a black and white rendition of it, and uh, I was on a conference call the other day, and I added color to it. Uh, <laughs> can you uh, sign that, and we'll give it away to a listener? Yeah. I'm dead serious. Yeah. I will sign the That's burger. a one-of-one one Frank Scalish cheeseburger. The burger. Oh, I got a, oh, I got a mark on my paper. Oh, can wow. we give that away uh, next Thursday? Any anytime you want. Let's give it work. away next week. All right, we will. And and then I'm gonna work on something too. We'll do some lure giveaways coming up real quick. Um, we'll, we'll just we'll make up some contests. We'll do the call in listeners again. Uh, yeah. live listeners. Live link. listeners. Yeah, if you just have a link and an yeah. internet connection. That's cool. I'm excited. We're gonna do a lot this year. Cheeseburger in paradise. Yo, amen, brother. All right. I Matt, need to hit hit some music. I'm shocked we got I'm shocked I made it back and then we got through the show. I'm shocked you're in your What are we talking about next week? Coherent. I don't even know yet. Probably what is next week? I might do I have a, a little mini series I want to I'm working at. Mini series would be good cuz I'm one two three weeks in town. Yeah, it'll work. Well, I think it's a two-parter. Um And then I'm in Japan. Dude. No, I might. I'll, I might be back. The twenty six, I think, we fly out a little bit. Like the twenty. You'll have to look at your schedule because you gave me your schedule. And I, I'm like <laughs> pretty dumb, isn't it? Yeah, I'm like holy shit. I could, no, I don't know. I'll just wait till you tell me you're we're going live. <laughs> I like it. All right, this has been another edition of Day Fourth, Man Frank's Galish. Special shout out to. Kyle Cordiano for jumping on live from Clayton, New York, and talking all things smallmouth, hitting us with some knowledge. We'll be back to regularly scheduled programming next Thursday, September 5th, 8.30 a.m. Central Time. No show Monday. It is a holiday. Back Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Frank, good to be back in the studio. Nice to have you back, Matthew. See ya.